Hi guys! Good day everyone! Welcome to another screencast in Immunology and Serology. I am your professor for today, Dr. Supache Basit, and for today's session, we shall be discussing labeled immune assays. For this particular session, our discussion shall be focusing, we will be focusing on the discussions on the different format for labeled assays, the comparison between heterogeneous and homogeneous assays, radioimmunoassay, enzyme immunoassays, fluorescent immunoassays, and chemiluminescent assays. So when we say labeled immunoassays, this particular type of immunoassays are designed for antigens or antibodies that may be small in size or present in very low concentration. It means that this particular type of immunoassays are said to be highly sensitive because they are able to detect uh, antigens or antibodies even if they occur in a very low concentration and the reason why we call it labeled it is primarily because we are using labeled reactants it could be an enzyme labeled fluorescent labeled or even a radio labeled okay so we are using labeled reactant so that we'll be able to monitor the amount of specific binding that has taken place so when we say specific binding we are actually pertaining to the binding between the antigen and antibody. So, for that reason, um, labeled immunoassays may be utilized for the measurement of analytes such as bacterial antigens, hormones, drugs, tumor markers, and even certain specific immunoglobulins. So, there are several platforms or formats of immunoassays, okay? One of which is called the competitive immunoassays. Now, in competitive immunoassays, you can just imagine that all the reactants that you have, so so all reactants, for example, you are trying to, to do an assay for certain patient's antigen, okay? So, we are mixing them together. So, the, the antibodies, okay, the labeled antigen, and even the patient antigen are actually being mixed together. So, the thing is, the labeled antigen competes with unlabeled patient's antigen for a limited number of antibody binding sites. So you might be wondering, what is the purpose of labeled antigens? So a while, a while ago, I told you that these labeled antigens are actually labeled with certain uh, with certain um, substance that can be assayed. So let's say, for example, if you are using enzyme label, in order for us to detect that particular enzyme label, uh, uh, we probably use um, spectrophotometry, spectrophotometer. So we add substrate and then there would be color reaction. Then that is measurable by spectrophotometer. Now let's say, for example, um, we're using radio-labeled. So radio-labeled antigen, in order for us to detect the presence of radio-labeled antigen, then we'll be using a gamma counter. Or if we're using a fluorescent-labeled antigen, then in order for us to detect the presence of a certain uh, labeled antigen that has bound with antibody, then we have to utilize fluorescent microscope. So, labeling certain antigens or antibodies are important so that we'll be able to detect them. Now, if a sample comes from us, let's say, for example, hormone, for this particular context, hormone may be, uh, may be contextualized as an antigen. Our hormone, let's say, for example, T4, um, is not labeled natural occurring in our body so that's not labeled which means that that cannot be detected unlike if it's labeled and for that reason for that reason in competitive immunoassay the amount of bound label is inversely proportional to the concentration of the labeled antigen so in order for me in order for us to understand uh, let's take a look at the illustration here so there are two sets of samples here we have sample A and sample B. So let's let's uh, create a certain hypothetical scenario. Let's say sample A is coming from a patient sample that that is that is suffering from the patient here has hypothyroidism, which means that which means that uh, that particular patient has a very limited amount of or a very low amount of a thyroid hormone. Let's say for example we're trying to measure T4 and then sample b on the other hand comes from a patient with 
hyperthyroidism. Now you can see the red symbol here. The the red symbol here represents let's say T4 or the thyroid hormone. Now take a look at sample A. Take a look at sample A. So since there are limited uh, concentration thyroid hormones or even very or the absence of thyroid hormone. So you, as you can see, the yellow thing here that represents the a T4 that has been uh, T4, that's also a thyroid hormone, but the thing is, it is labeled with a radioisotope. So, so that particular labeled antigen, which is actually part of the reagent, has actually, as has have, were able to bind with the antibody binding site. Hence, that is detectable, but that is detectable. So, we can actually detect, okay, that particular that particular binding. Now, if you're going to look at patient B, patient in patient B, um, the patient has hyperthyroidism, which means that he has more thyro thyroid hormones, T4, as compared to, to sample A or to patient A, which means that some of the red thing here, which is the, pa the patient's antigen, were able to bind with the antibody, meaning some of the labeled antigens were not able to bind to the patient's antibody because um, I mean I, I, no I'm sorry that's not the patient antibody. Um, some of the labeled antigens were not able to bind with the antibody because the antibody has limited binding sites. So what happened here? Only some of the labeled antigens were able to bind to the limited antibody antibody binding site. So if there's a color reaction, it is not as intense as sample A. So the signal strength, it says here, is usually inversely related to the concentration of the analyte. So comparing the intensity, let's say, for example, the color reaction um, represents the intensity or the signal. So if you're going to look at sample A, it is more intense as compared to the sample B. Okay. On the other hand, when we speak of non-competitive immunoassay, the antibody is first possibly absorbed to a solid phase. So take a look at the difference in competitive immunoassays. All the reactants are mixed together simultaneously. Okay? In contrast with that of the non-competitive immunoassays wherein antibody is first possibly absorbed to a solid phase. So a solid phase um, could come in different forms. Uh, practically speaking, some could come in nitrocellulose strip, some, some could come in a simple test tube, or even the well. Okay, so an unknown patient antigen is allowed to react, okay, with the solid phase, with the antibody that has been absorbed as solid phase, okay, and that will be captured by the antibody in the solid phase. So, we have to wash it to remove unbound antigens. So when you say unbound antigen, these are antigens uh, that we're not able to bind with the antibody that has been absorbed in the solid phase. Okay? And then we add a second antibody with a label so that there would be a reaction. So this time you'll be adding a labeled a second labeled antibody. Okay. Which means that the amount of label measured is directly proportional to the amount of patient's antigen. So let's say we're using an enzyme label, so the higher the absorbance, then the more concentrated or the higher concentration of the patient's antigen. So again, like what I did tell you a while ago, we can utilize several labels such as uh, radioactive substances, enzymes, fluorescent compounds, and even chemiluminescent substances, okay? All of these may be utilized as labels, okay? Good pa sila may label. Okay. So anyway, uh, if you will be looking at the illustration here, uh, again, we have um, sample A and sample B. Okay. As you can see here, okay, there are several steps, okay? So let's examine for example A. So sample A is an example of a negative control, while sample B is an example of a patient that is positive for a certain analyte. Okay, so let's compare. Um, in sample A, uh, since it's, non it's a negative control, it doesn't have and uh, the antigen is negative, so it's not present. And then for sample B, 
So we'll be adding the antigen or the patient sample in the in the sample B. Now, what what are these? These are antibodies that have been absorbed in the solid phase. Okay? And then second step is that we wash we wash so that we'll be able to remove unbound antigen. And then we add the second antibody. Now, what can you say about the second antibody? Take a look at the FC portion of the second antibody. The FC portion has been has been um, uh, labeled, okay, with a certain substance. In this case, let's say let's say it is it is an enzyme, okay. And then and then what will happen is that after we had added enzyme labeled antibody, okay, that binds to a different epitope of an analyte, for example, D. So you can actually see here there, there in, in step four you can see the red dot that represents the patient's antigen and then one of the fab portion actually bind with the patient's antigen the fab portion of the of the second antibody okay and then after that we and then again we wash unbound materials and then we add the substrate. So since it is an enzyme labeled, in order for us to have a color reaction, it is very important that we'll be adding substrate or the substance being acted upon by the enzyme. So what will happen is that there would be a color reaction. So the more intense the color is, then the higher the concentration of the of the patient's antigen. Okay? So as compared to to sample A, since it's a negative control, you won't be able to see any reaction because in the first place, there hasn't been any antigen-antibody complex. Okay, so moving on, let us now discuss specific um, immunoassays. Okay, so do you know that the first immunoassay that was developed was that of radio immunoassay, so more properly known, popularly known as RIA. So in RIA, we are actually using radioactive labels wherein isotope or, or sorry iodine 125 is considered to be as the most popular so the principle in rhea is that um that particular binding of the immune complex if that ever happens there since it is a radio label it will emit a gamma radiation which could only be detected by a special machine known as the gamma counter Okay, so radio immunoassay is extremely, extremely sensitive, which means that even in the smallest, minute, that's how exaggerated it is, smallest, minute amount can be detected. And the good thing about it is that it is also precise. So, which means that it can measure trace amount of analytes such as hormones, serum proteins, vitamins, and these particular analytes come in very small size or very small concentration okay so in radio immunoassay the amount of label in the bound phase is in there is indirectly proportional to the amount of patient antigen so do you remember the principle of competitive immunoassay so that's exactly the principle of radio immunoassay okay so what are the disadvantages? Well, as we all know, it's quite dangerous to be working with radioactive substances. So that's one. Okay, it's physically dangerous. The number two, uh, there is also a special procedure for us to dispose even radioactive waste, even low-level radioactive waste. So there's a special procedure. You cannot just throw it in ordinary trash can. And then, of course, the short shelf life of some reagents. Okay, so if the test is not really that popular, so there's a chance that these reagents could expire and of course it entails additional operational costs on the part of the, the laboratory. So most of the time, this radioimmunoassay is actually part of the nuclear medicine section of a certain hospital. Okay, so let's talk about, sorry, let's talk about the enzyme immunoassays. So obviously, the reason why we call it enzyme immunoassay is that we are using enzyme as labels, okay? So enzyme immunoassays um, are using enzyme as labels, and these enzymes will react with suitable substances, okay, to produce breakdown that may be chromogenic, 
which means that there will be change in color, fluorogenic, okay, um, fluorogenic uh, glows somehow it glows in the dark and then luminescent, uh, luminescent, okay, so which can be detected by a chemiluminescent machine, okay. So, um, in enzyme immunology, we are using enzyme labels such as alkaline phosphatase and horseradish peroxidases. So, these enzymes have the highest turnover. So, when you say turnover, we are actually contextualizing it to the converge, the ability of the enzyme to be uh, converted by the substrates. Okay, and they are highly sensitive, and they are much, and they are much easy to perform. Uh, and easy to detect. Okay, so in enzyme immunization, um, there are actually uh, two schools of thoughts, as you say. Uh, we have the heterogeneous, and the other one is the homogeneous enzyme immunization. So let's talk about first the heterogeneous. So, primarily speaking, when we say heterogeneous, this one requires a physical step, okay, I mean a step to physically separate free analyte from bound analyte. So we have to separate them. Okay? So again, there is a, the principle of competitive immunoassay. So in competitive immunoassay, okay, or competitive enzyme immunoassay, um, we are using an enzyme labeled antigen and then this particular enzyme labeled antigen will try to compete with unlabeled patient's antigen. So again, we have to contextualize it. When we say unlabeled patient's antigen, this could be substances that can be detected in our body, such as drugs and hormones. Okay. So again, it involves enzyme-labeled antigen competing with unlabeled patient's antigen for binding site on antibody molecules. So as what I said, it is being used for measuring small antigens that are relatively pure and small in concentration, such as drugs and hormones. And this particular assay would also have high specificity. Okay, so in a non-competitive enzyme in the assay, so I'm still under the heterogeneous. So this one offers high sensitivity and specificity, simplicity, and low cost. One example is, sorry, I forgot the word. I just realized that I've been using this and then I haven't attached the jack. So anyway, so one example, so you can, you can actually tell the change in microphone, okay? So one example is enzyme link immunosorbent assay or the ELISA. So enzyme link immunosorbent assay is actually being used to measure antibody production to infectious agents that are difficult to isolate and for auto-antibody testing. So, um, we're using this for HIV, Hepatitis B, and Hepatitis C. Um, it is easily applied even to the point of care and home testing. There, you now have the COVID-19 antibody testing. So, this may be utilized using the ELISA principle. Okay. So, let us discuss the different platforms. So, we have the heterogeneous enzyme amino acids or the ELISA. Here, we are trying to detect patient's antibody. So, always remember that if we're trying to detect patient's antibody, then the one that should be bound to the solid phase should be an antigen. And since we're trying to detect patient's antibody, the best specimen for analysis is the patient serum. So, patient serum with a known antibody is added and then we give them time to react. And then of course, there would be the so-called washing, a wash step, and then an enzyme labeled antiglobulin, that is the secondary antibody is added. So what is this one? Enzyme labeled antiglobulin. So this particular type of antibody has this characteristic. One, it is labeled with an enzyme. And then two, the, this particular second antibody, okay, will bind not with the antigen, but it will bind, okay, at the FC portion of the patient's antibody. So when we say FC, we're pertaining to fragment crystalline, okay? So the second antibody reacts with any patient antibody that is bound to the solid phase. Now, if, for example, the patient is not 
uh, is not positive for certain antibody, so there won't be any immune complex. So this particular second antibody will not bind to the antigen that has been bound to the solid phase. It only binds with any patient antibody that is bound to the solid phase. Okay. If no patient antibody is bound to the solid phase, then the second labeled antibody will not bind. Okay. So there would be a second wash step and then we'll be adding an enzyme substrate. So again, the purpose of the substrate is for us to be able to visualize any changes in the color reaction, fluorescence, or luminescence. So this can be measured. Okay, so the simplest of them all is the changing color, which can be measured using fluorescent microscope. So this, uh, sorry, changing color can be measured using spectrophotometer. Okay, so this amount is directly proportional to the amount of anti that. Uh, oh. Let. This amount is directly proportional to the amount of antibody present in the specimen. Okay, so still part of the heterogeneous assays are the different um, uh, are the different examples of capture assays, such as the sandwich immune assays. Okay, so here uh, it is best suited to antigens that have multiple determinants. If you want to detect, detect cytokines, protein, tumor markers. And we are also using this for the measurement of some immunoglobulin. So why sandwich immune assays? Okay. So anyway, in capture assays, excess antibodies attached to the solid phase is allowed to combine with the test sample to capture any antigen present. Again, in this case, we're trying to detect the presence of antigen. Which means if you're trying to detect the presence of antigen, the one that should be bound to the solid phase or the one that should be attached to the solid phase would be antibody. After a certain or appropriate incubation period, enzyme labeled okay, antibody is added. So the second antibody recognizes a different epitope or binding sites that the solid phase antibody and complete the sandwich. So Again, if you can just use your vivid imagination, so the one that is found in the solid phase is an antibody, okay? The one that comes from the patient sample is an antigen. And then we add the second antibody, which is the enzyme labeled antibody, okay? So here, the enzyme labeled antibody is the one that will bind to the patient antigen, forming a sandwich. So yung tinapay is the antibody, that is found in the solid phase, yung palaman is the antigen, and then the other tinapay on top is the second antibody that was able to recognize the epitope. Now, what's the difference of this capture assay to, to this uh, ELISA wherein we are trying to detect antibody? Okay, the difference is that here we're trying to detect antibody. And then, the difference, another thing is that here, the second antibody is an enzyme labeled antiglobulin, which will bind at the FC portion of the patient's antibody. Unlike here, okay, the second antibody will simply bind at okay, will simply recognize the epitope of the patient's antigen. Okay, so that's the difference. Okay, we call it the capture acids. Okay, so um where am I? <laughs> Aye. So, in capture assays, either a colored or chemiluminescent reaction product is detected. So, again, if it's a color, colored reaction, then you might be using the spectrophotometer. So, enzymatic activity is directly proportional to the amount of antigen in the test sample. Okay. Wow. Let's now discuss the homogeneous enzyme immune assays. So, exact opposite of heterogeneous because here, these antigen antibody systems do not require a washing or separation step. Okay, another thing is that the enzyme activity here is directly in proportion to the concentration of patient antigen or HAP10 when present in test solution. So, primarily speaking, in homogeneous enzyme immune assays, when a certain antibody binds a specific, a specific determinant sites on the antigen or the epitope, the active site on the enzyme is blocked. 
So, it will result in measurable loss of activity. So, there won't be any activity at all because the active site on the enzyme is blocked because the antibody has already bound to the epitope of the antigen. Uh, um, unfortunately, um, homogeneous assays are enzyme assays are less sensitive than heterogeneous but they are rapid and much simpler to perform and they are being utilized to determine low molecular weight analytes present in serum and in urine such as the HCG test for pregnancy test so that's an example of hormones therapeutic drugs okay and even drugs of abuse so drug testing they are using the principle of homogeneous enzyme in your assays. Okay. Now, another variation or, or of that particular type of immune assays is the rapid immune assays. So here, um, it is a membrane-based single-use disposable assay. Okay. So again, COVID-19 rapid antibody testing is waving. Okay. So this involves antigen or antibody being coupled to the membrane. So the membrane here in the cassette serves as your solid case and instead of using machine in in the de in detecting differences in color reaction here we are simply looking for change in color reaction or repression of a line to determine a positive or a negative result however in some in some cases it may require the separate addition of patient sample wash reagent labeled antigen or antibody and the substrate so here's the principle of the rapid immuno assays which may also utilize immunochromatography because of the capillary flow of the clinical sample it's positive with analyte so as you can see here in illustration a you have here the the conjugate pod with monoclonal antibodies with colloidal gold Okay, then there would be a capillary flow of the clinical sample. So this would be a urine or a serum. So because of its immunochromatography, so there would be um, capillary flow. And then if the patient is positive for the analyte, it will bind with the monoclonal antibodies okay, with the colloidal gold. And because of the capillary flow, it will then be captured by the... Um, uh, anti-IgG okay so this is the test line and then this is the control line so the control line and the test line the control line should always be uh, should always have a line in order for the test to be considered as valid okay so uh, a test line is considered as positive if there's also a line here. So what does the test line consist of? So the test line consists of monoclonal antibodies to analyte plus plus the antibody to analyte with colonal, colloidal gold and in between them okay, is the analyte of interest. Okay? So that's immunochromatography as the principle of rapid, ra rapid, of rapid amino acids. Okay, so moving on, we have the fluorescent amino acids. So, the fluorescent amino acid is restricted to qualitative observations involving the use of a fluorescent microscope. So, qualitative, which means it's either you, po you are positive or negative. So, However, even if it's just qualitative, you can actually grade the intensity of the fluorescence by grading it against dark background. So it is used for rapid identification of microorganisms in cell culture or infected tissue or tumor-specific antigens on neoplastic tissue and even in the transplantation antigens. So there are actually two types of fluorescent immune acids. So if you're trying to detect the presence of antigens, then you have to utilize the direct immunofluorescent assay. Here, in the direct immunofluorescent assay, okay, you are trying to detect antigen. So, an antibody that is conjugated with the fluorescent tag is, direct, is added directly to a known antigen that is fixed to a microscope slide. Okay? So, a known antigen comes from the patient sample, okay, and then it, it will be fixed with 
um, antibody that is conjugated with the fluorescent tag. Okay. After incubation in wash tub, the slide is read using a fluorescent microscope. So the technique demonstrates the presence of pathogens in patient sample, which means that here in direct immunofluorescent assay, your sample could be a throat swab, wound swab, CSF sample, or if you're trying to detect blood pathogens, that would also be possible, body fluids. Okay, so fluorescent tag. Okay, what is a fluorescent tag? Antibody that is conjugated with a fluorescent tag. Here, we are going to use fluorescent dyes, such as um, one of the most popular, I think, is the fluorescent isothiocyanate, and the other one is rhodamine dye. So, this may be utilized as well. Okay, now what's the difference between the direct immunofluorescent assay and the other one is the indirect immunofluorescent assay. So, in the indirect immunofluorescent assay, the patient serum is incubated with a known antigen attached to a solid phase. So, here, the one that is the solid phase is the slide, and the one that is attached to to the solid phase is the patient. Uh, sorry, is the known antigen. So you add the patient serum because you're trying to detect antibodies. So the slide is washed, and then an anti-human immunoglobulin containing a fluorescent tag is added. Again, here the second antibody is the anti-human immunoglobulin, which will bind to the F portion of the patient's antibody if the patient antibody is attached to the known antigen in the solid phase meaning the patient is positive so there you'll be able to find uh, to form a sandwich so what is a sandwich so first is the antigen known antigen attached to the solid phase then the second layer is the patient's antibody and then the third layer is the anti-human immunoglobulin so it's like preparing a sandwich with palaman, tinapay, tinapay. How bizarre. Sandwich na pa rin naman, okay? So, an antibody, therefore, patient antibody, therefore, in indirect immunofluorescent assay can be identified. There. So, here, the first illustration is an example of the direct immunofluorescent assay. So, for, say, for example, this is a body fluid or a throat swab. You want to detect streptococcus. So here you have a streptococcus. And then you add you add a fluorescent labeled antibody that is specific to the streptococcus, group A streptococcus. And it has an isothiocyanate, fluorescent isothiocyanate. So what will happen is that when you when you look under the microscope, okay, you'll be able to see a fluorescent microorganisms. So the same thing here, this is an indirect immunofluorescent assay. So, in the indirect immunofluorescent assay, the, the known antigen is actually uh, attached to the solid phase. In this case, the solid phase is a slide. And then we add patient serum. If it's positive with patient antibody, then there will be an immune complex. And then we add a fluorescent legal anti human immune problem that will bind at the FC portion of the patient's antibody. Okay. So another variation is the fluorescent polarization immunoassay or the FPIA. So here we are using this to determine the concentration of therapeutic drugs and hormones. So this is based on the principle that whenever there are changes in the polarization of fluorescent light emitted from a labeled molecule, when it is bound by antibody. So if the labeled molecule is bound to the antibody, the molecule will then emit an increased amount of polarized light. Okay, so in this illustration, here in letter A, in this illustration, the sample analyte concentration is low. So, mababa yung concentration ng analyte. Therefore, since it is low, the antibody, so here's the antibody, okay, will bind most of the labeled analyte, restricting its rotation. So, the light will not be able to rotate because the antibody has already bind. Okay, when excited by the polar polarized light. So, the emitted fluorescence will remain polarized. Okay, so when you say remain polarized, the light waves are uh, all oscillate with the same orientation. Oscillate may equal polarized light. Now, if we'll be comparing it, 
with the second scenario here, okay, if the patient sample has high concentration, sorry, has high concentration of analyte, this unlabeled analyte will occupy most of the antibody binding site. So instead of occupy, so here, as you can see, the concentration is very low. So the antibodies will, will actually bind with the polarized light. But here, here, what will happen is that the antibodies uh, will not be able anymore to bind the polarized light because, because they have already the analyte with them. So what will happen, okay, be leaving the labeled analyte free to rotate, okay? So the light waves emitted by the rotating label, labels will not be uniformly oriented. So I will be attaching the principle of FPIA in this module. I'll be attaching a video, so make sure that you'll be able to watch the video so that uh, you'll be able to understand. So if there's an animation, you'll be able to see the rotation of light. Okay, and then we also have the chemiluminescent acids. Okay, so here it also followed the same principle of basic antigen-antibody combination or the so-called immune complex. So it also involves the emission of light caused by a chemical reaction. So this particular chemical reaction is most of the time an example of oxidation reaction. So as we all know, um, this particular chemical reaction will produce an excited molecule. So an excited molecule, but eventually after its excitation, it will decay back to its original state. So, in this chemiluminescent immune assay, it may be utilized for both heterogeneous and homogeneous assay because labels can be attached to either antigen or antibody. Okay, so I will be um, including also an animation on, on chemiluminescent immune assays in, the mod, in this particular module. So, that's the end of my presentation. So, I hope you guys uh, ha, uh, learned something today. Uh, for graduate students, uh, I hope that uh, you're, uh, you were reviewed on the principle of labeled immune assays. So, with that, I'd like to bid my farewell, farewell temporarily for this particular session. Stay safe, everyone. God bless you all.